Yeah, so what does the approach need to be offensively to obviously stay within themselves, do what they do well? They can't obviously come out in a wishbone or do something that they are, are entirely unfamiliar with. Uh, they got to stay within themselves and do what they do well. But at the same time, you want to present something different than what you've presented for the last, uh, what, 11 games last season on tape to, to, to make Alabama to prepare for something and surprise them to a certain extent. Yeah, I think I think a lot of that Mark has to has to do with time, right? Like I mentioned before, this is the first time our quarterback gets to have the same offense coordinator two years in a row. And as you look at last year, not just Miami, but every team in college football, this past season when it went through the COVID, you weren't going through the same normal regulations that you're going through for for a full off season, right? So a lot of teams were already behind the gun, including a team like Miami who brought in a brand new quarterback, brand new offensive system. Well, now we're in year two, full off season. Miami is kind of on the opposite end of, of what actually Alabama is coming into September 4th, where we actually have the veteran quarterback. We have the more continuity on the offensive line along with the you know offensive weapons and the coaching staff. So this is something where Miami kind of has an edge, right? There, there isn't much edges you can give Miami to compared to a team like Alabama. But this seems to be like one of the ones where this isn't something Miami is used to, and I think that is going to be what they're going to have to use to – kind of be in this football game is like what you said, be Miami football players and play Miami football. And I think uh, with, with the time of last year, you're going to see a lot more plays and uh, air raid system. And I think you got to throw it 35 to 40 times on this Bama defense. Tony, I'm going to give you the most difficult task here. I, I'm going to have you look for a weakness here uh, on Alabama, just, just because uh, you, you know, you covered the team every day. Mm -hmm. uh, you write about the team. You, um, interact with uh, Alabama fans and other SEC fans, uh, anti-Bama fans, uh, all the time. And you look at this football program, and it seems infallible. Uh, for as good as Clemson and Ohio State are, we saw what the separation was last year. And uh, until we see otherwise, we would have to believe that Alabama just reloads. And we're hearing that this could be the best Alabama defense that we've seen since 2016 and 17. Yeah, I was going to say, if you're looking for a, a hole or a weakness on defense, I, I'd say good luck because Alabama is just totally stacked there. I think they have the best linebacking core in, in the nation. Uh, when you look at the inside linebacking duo of Christian Harris and Henry Tuatoa, and then the two edge rushers and Will Anderson Jr. and Chris Allen, I mean, that's that's insane. Uh, so defense is going to be tough for Miami. I think, you know, it, for when you talk about Alabama with the ball, you know, uh, against Miami's defense, Look, the, the offensive line, Alabama's offensive line has some talent. Um, you know, it, it's there and it will develop. But at the moment, you know, just because of a few injuries this offseason, they haven't really had the chance to play all together. So you, you've got five talented guys, but is that offensive line gelled? And, you know, can you get through that? And then if you can provide some pressure, can you force um, – Bryce Young into some of those, you know, first game or first start kind of jitters. I mean, you're kind of reaching at straws uh, to, to kind of find weaknesses in this Alabama team because it's so loaded. But at the same time, that's kind of the way I think, you know, Miami's going to have to do it. I think they're going to have to bend but not break on defense. And then when it comes to offense, I think they're just going to have to beat this offensive line. Um, and then that might be the, the smallest chink at the, at the moment in, in Alabama's armor right now. And if you can do that, get to Bryce Young, maybe get him riled up. Uh, then you can start seeing those mistakes happen, and maybe you can capitalize on that. But um, it, at, even on the offensive side of the ball, though, you know, when you look at Alabama, they've got a great backfield of Brian Robinson, uh, Jace McClellan, Trey Sanders, Rodell Williams. Uh, the receivers, they lost two first-round picks, but then they, you know, grabbed Jamison Williams from Ohio State, and they have John Mechie, who would be a number one on most teams uh, anyways as a wide receiver. So, there's plenty of talent there as well. Um, I, I just think, you know, Miami's going to have to play a really strong game and, and, and really kind of hope for all the breaks if, if they're going to pull this upset. You know, Mark, no disrespect to, uh, like, John Benchy or Jameson Williams. And obviously a diehard Miami fan, I'm actually excited to see Aggie Hall. I mean, because the kid is the real deal, right? So, you know, no disrespect to those other two. But, man, Aggie Hall is on a different level. No, yeah, and he makes absolutely incredible catches during the spring game. He's a guy that's listed on the – on the he's in the two deep, but he's kind of, you know, on that second uh, string of receivers. Um I'm sure we'll get to see him and, you know, geez, it seems like every time he steps on the field, he makes one of those kind of plays, 
but um, he, he won't be a, a starter just yet for Alabama. But that, like, you know, just from seeing him in that spring game, I mean, he, right. I, I see him as maybe the next Jerry Judy over there. He's just because he, he can make some some absolutely just crazy catches. Um, that that's who he reminds me of just from watching him. At, you know, fr- from the brief time we've been able to watch him. Coaches are usually cautious about quarterback competition, even if they've got it in the back of their mind and they pretty much know, hey, Kate, we want to go in this direction. They'll let them play it out through the spring into fall and maybe with uh, 10 days to two weeks left in the fall, then they'll make a decision or make make it known and announce what everybody knew all along that so-and-so is going to be the starting quarterback. But they just wanted to leave it out there to make them press, make them earn it. And with Nick Saban and Bryce Young, considering he's only thrown a couple handfuls of passes at a big time level and no meaningful passes for him to be just, you're the starter, take it away. That speaks volumes to me. It definitely does. And it, like, e- even during the, the, the reports that we've had that, you know, Bryce has not been as electric or you know, maybe they were dealing with uh, holes in the offense. So, you know, the, the numbers weren't that great during some of the scrimmages. Even after those performances, Nick Saban's only came out and, and praised him. In fact, if there's been a critique of the offense, it's been the offense around Bryce Young. So I think he's really answered every test um, that Alabama has thrown at him. Look, even when he talks to the media, uh, you normally you see these new guys and their first time talking to the media. They're a little shy. Bryce t- took the ball, uh, took the bull by the horns, and you know he he seems like a, a composed vet, you know, in front of cameras. I know that's you know, different than the football field itself. But I think it just speaks to his confidence. When you look at him, he's a guy that's been here, you know, for a while now. He was a star in high school. You know, he actually replaced JT Daniels at Metter Day High School in California. So, you know, the whole pressure, I guess, of replacing Mac Jones at Alabama, it's not as great because he's kind of already been in this situation before. So he knows how to handle it. Um, and I think he's, you know, like I said, gained that trust of his teammates, of his coaching staff, and uh, they believe in him. And I think that's only going to help add to, to that confidence, knowing that he has that belief from his teammates. So um, it, it is nice. I think I think it will help him, the fact that they just kind of handed him this job, because it will only increase that confidence. You know, I think you needed to build that up a little bit this offseason, and I think that it, they did that. Hey, Brad and Derek, when I look at this Miami team compared to last season at this same time, the one spot I look at, and unless proven otherwise, I see a downgrade is, of course, you had two NFL defensive ends. Now, one opted out, and Greg Russo. I was really looking forward to seeing when we were uh, piping up the Clemson-Miami game during the offseason. I was thinking, okay, the one Miami shot in this game is, Look at the Giants Patriots Super Bowl when Strahan and Justin Tuck and those guys got after Brady. Great quarterbacks don't do so great when they're on their backside and when you got a lead pass rush. And that's what I was hoping to see. But of course, Russo opted out. I'm I'm thinking the same thing here, but I don't see that type of star power at the DN position. Yeah, me and Co were actually sitting next to each other at that game while it was raining, man. And I'll tell you what, I think the intensity of our guys have to be there in this football game. I think you know, being there, you know, right next to the sideline and us being able to see it, seeing the faces and the way, you know, the coaches and the players would react. You you mentioned, you know, some of the great defensive ends we had last year. That first two drives against Clemson, I'm telling you right now, those defensive ends were playing like the first rounders that they were. Unfortunately, flags happened, you know, you know, misdirection of plays happened. One one bad play, you know, turned a zero zero game to a thirteen zero with in a matter of, you know, three to four minutes. It's the adversity and the way we come back from things like that that I want to see from this Miami team. And a lot of that has to go with experience on the leaders of the team and also on the coaching staff. And, I mean, to Tony's point, everything he just praised with Bryce Young and the compliments that his teammates and his coaches feel comfortable with, these are all things that Miami already have the answers for with a guy like De'Ara King. So this is where, again, I feel very comfortable having a a second-year offensive coordinator going along with a Heisman candidate quarterback. And, again, we're facing a, a talented Bryce Young but let's not get it twisted. He's only thrown 22 passes in college football, only 156 yards and one touchdown. I need you to I need to see it to believe it. You know, having Zach McLeod on one side, obviously you have DeAndre Stevenson transfer from Tennessee, so he's already seen Alabama a couple times. Um, and I would agree with you, Mark. I mean, obviously, I would feel much more confident having like a Jalen Phillips or a Greg Rousseau or even a Quincy Roche lined up on the outside. 
But, you know, again, it, it's college football, next man up. And obviously those two guys, you know, Jalen Phillips and Greg Rousseau got drafted in the first round. Who's it not to say that Zach McLeod don't come off that left edge and, you know, gets three sacks? You know, we don't know. Obviously, he's a six-year guy. You know, he's experienced. Um, I think he's better suited to be a D-end than he is a linebacker. Um, so, again, we'll, we'll wait and find out. Obviously, you know, um, like the Alabama guy said, is, you know, the offensive line is probably the weakest that Alabama's O-line has been in quite some time. So maybe that's where we can take advantage. Obviously, you know, with John Ford and Nessa Severia and uh, Harrison Hunt, some of the guys up the middle, maybe that helps out our DNs. And again, our DNs really just need to get up field and contain, right, and, and turn everything back to the inside. Um, and don't listen. At the end of the day, they just can't let the, the big the big time game, the Alabama, get into their head. They just have to stay mature, stay confident, and just play football. So I think Miami's got probably its best running back core. What do you think, Brad, for quite some time? Yeah, you talk about a three-headed monster, right? You got Cam Harris coming back one more year, who seems to be the returning starter and the the heavy favorite to get you know the the heavy load. What what it seems like, but then you got guys like Don Chaney and uh, Rooster, um, like people know. You got a lot of different types of backs. Um, I would honestly say this is probably the rotation of backs that I could say in a very long time, going back to the early two thousands. And then another name I could honestly mention, you probably won't see him much in the Alabama game, but a name to look out for throughout the season is going to be Cody Brown. Um, he's going to be someone similar to what Travis Homer brought to this Miami Hurricane football team his first and second year. Um, look for him on special teams. He's a guy that, you know, is a force to be reckoned with. He's a very strong body, can pretty much run through contact, and also is elusive. So uh, I'm liking what I'm seeing from the running back group. So, Derek, for you, what um... – I'm guessing there are no moral victories, but at the same time being realistic, and I'm going to throw 10 to 15% out there as Miami's chances of winning this game. Who knows? But that that's about what I estimate. So it's not impossible. If they win the game, will I be surprised? Yeah, I will be surprised. I won't be like in utter shock uh, if Miami wins this game because I do think that they've got a puncher's chance. They've got a lot of talent on the team. But realistically, and, and a win may be realistic for you, Derek, so whatever that is, but if, <laughs> if, you're, if, you're, if you're thinking it's not, like a lot of Miami people don't think it's realistic, what, how, where would you come away from that game feeling, feeling good about the performance? Well, I always say this, and, and again, I, I've said Miami has a, a legit opportunity to shock college football and, and win this game, right? Um, if you don't win, but you're at least competitive within 10 points per se, right? The spread's 19 and a half. If you're telling me that you can stay within 10 points of the number one Alabama team, again, I'm not into moral victories, but at the end of the day, that's only got to boost your confidence. And like I've told people before, this game against Alabama does not make or break the University of Miami's 2021 season. This that means nothing. Obviously, your focus as a Miami Hurricane should be your next 10 games. Win your conference. Go against Clemson you know, potentially in the ACC title game, again, go to Charlotte, beat Clemson, and who knows? If you run the table, you might play Alabama again in a playoff. So the, the, the main thing for me is to see, you know, continue, climb that ladder of success. You know, you were 6-7, and seven, you were 8-3. and three. Now can we go 10-2, and two, maybe 11-1? and one. That's what I want to see. And again, if you lose, don't lose like you did to Clemson. Don't lose like you did to Carolina. Like, lose respectively like you've been there before. So to me, it all boils down to, what is the maturity level going to be either win against Alabama and then how are you going to respond against App State? Or when you lose to Alabama, how are you going to respond against App State? Yeah, and I mean, we mentioned Nick Saban and Dabo Sweeney, right? And those are two big not big big name head coaches in college football. And it took them four years. It was year four for both of those head coaches to where when they started having a, a successful program as far as, you know, having at least eight to nine wins. And I think this is year four for Manny Diaz, and this is his time to do it. I will say that Alabama uh, went undefeated in the regular season uh, year two for Saban. But for Saban? Yeah, he, he's year two. Yeah, so he, maybe it was yeah, deep, he had a big okay. year in year two. Well, he, you know, it's hard to compare anyone to that standard. That, you're, that's right, you're right. You, you got, you did, it's hard to compare anybody to Bama, to be honest. It's, it really is. Do recruits show up to these uh, neutral site games? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Brad, do we know what uh, that list looks like for Miami? Uh, not not as of right now. Um, I know the Bama Miami game. There isn't too many visitors for that game, but I can tell you the Miami Michigan State game. Uh, be on the lookout for that game. You're going to see about half of the recruiting class that Miami currently has signed, along with about seven to eight different targets, all at that Michigan State game. 
Tony, do you know of anyone on the Bama target list that's uh, going to Atlanta? Yeah, let me. Uh, you know, I'm not the recruiting guy, so I'm gonna try to. Um, I'm gonna try to pull up a. Uh, Feel from the recruiting guy. Yeah. <laughs> who's gonna be in Atlanta? But um, I, I know that there's gonna be a, a whole host of uh, of recruits at that game. I, I don't know if I have the list in front of me right now, but. Um, oh, you're good. But yeah, yeah, there, there's going to be there's going to be a ton of uh, a, a ton of yeah, it, it, all these opening games. Alabama does these, you know, for a reason because they put you in a high profile. You know, you're you're able to you know be seen not only on a national stage, but a lot of these kids they want to come to games like this in big cities. So um, th- there's going to be a lot of attention and, and a lot of players there. I thought they did it just uh, to get under my skin, so I get on here and rant and rave why Alabama never travels anywhere. <laughs> yeah, well, here, um, Earl Little Jr., uh, Emmanuel Henderson, Kobe Prentice, uh, Antonio Kite, Jake Jake Pope, Dane Shore, Elijah Brown, Isaiah Bond, LT Overton, Peter Woods, uh, Jalil Hurley, Terrence Love. So, I mean, shoot, a, a ton of names. The, the list keeps on growing, but um, a ton, a ton of names uh, coming to see this game. And there's three or four of those names that you just mentioned that if Miami finds a way to pull up the upset, I could see a three or four of those names starting to get some more attention and love for Miami after that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I, it goes both ways. I mean, cause if you, if you bring re- recruits here and they see, you know, they're also going to get to see what Miami puts on the, on the field as well. So you're, you're right. Bam in Miami should be a good one. Hopefully the Canes can keep it close and we, We'll watch a game into the fourth quarter. Of course, the Tide's a big uh, 19-and-a-half-point favorite game in Atlanta. The Tide used to playing these big season openers against the likes of Wisconsin, Michigan, Florida State, USC. You could name them off over the last uh, 12 to 13 years under the Saban era. Miami's last splash in this type of game was against LSU a couple of years ago in Houston, right? That Dallas. didn't turn out Dallas. too well yeah. against uh, – that was before we knew Joe Burrow was Joe Burrow. And uh, LSU put it on the Canes on that one. But it's a whole new staff, whole new team. This is what we got. Miami and Alabama, 330 Eastern from Atlanta. 